Okay, so for people that may be new or may not be used to our new format, we have a specific topic. And then instead of kind of going around the room like we previous used to do, because we tend to have too many people for that, um, if you have something specific to add to the topic, you can type it in the chat. And then, you know, wherever we have multiples of the same one, we'll kind of start a discussion on that particular one. So tonight's topic is reinforcement challenges using unused reinforcements. So I put in the messenger, kind of think about the unusual things that you've used to reinforce your dog. We all probably would agree that treats is probably the easiest for us as handlers to learn how to use, not that all dogs want that. And, you know, but this the easiest one to learn. So most people that have done any kind of dog training have used treats as reinforcement. So instead of discussing treats tonight, we want to look at the more unusual stuff. So, and I see one coming in already, which is great. Keep them coming in. For Azul, and I'm just going to start there because it kind of gives you guys an idea and lets you think a minute as you're typing in the chats. So probably one of the biggest service dog complaints out there is from handlers that complain about how the general public distracts their dog. So Azul learned really early on keywords like um, gorgeous, handsome, beautiful, and he knew they were talking about him. And as a younger dog, that really, really distracted him. So I turned those words into what, if you hear that word and you look at me or step closer to me, you're going to be highly reinforced. And so I did that early on with treats, but then I turned the words themselves into reinforcement. So he loves to hear people say those words, but then instead of being distracted by those words and, and then focusing on the people that are saying them, that reminds him every time he hears it to focus on me even more. So now I don't have to redirect him from getting distracted with that. So I will tell you that is the hardest one that I have ever had to figure out to use but because he was so motivated by um, praise and being able to greet those strangers, I had to find something that really worked. And that's commonly how he mostly gets reinforced. If somebody says he's beautiful or whatever, as we're walking past and we're on a timeline or I feel really bad or whatever, and I don't want to communicate, he knows just by my continued walking and not stopping to talk that focus on me and to ignore them. Usually because he does enjoy socializing and as you guys all know me, I tend to talk a lot. So I pretty much enjoy socializing. I don't mind stopping to stay in the chat and answer questions as long as I feel well enough and I have the time and you know, I have a day where everybody wants to ask questions. So Azul has learned that by focusing on me super intently in that time when somebody says, oh my God, there's a puppy, he's so beautiful. You know, that if he focuses on me in that time, chances are we'll probably stop. And eventually after chatting for a few minutes, I'll probably give him permission to go stop. So he maintains his focus until he gets that. And then if he does it after we walk away, you know, if I don't give him permission to say hi, after we walk away, I will then make sure I stop to give him some praise myself because he's missing that petting from the stranger that he was hoping for. So I take that time to pet him for me as we continue walking. So either way he gets reinforced for it, but that has been like my biggest one. And probably like if I could give one tip to all service dog handlers, you know, if you have a dog who is absolutely distracted by people saying puppy, 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 or if you have a dog that's absolutely distracted by people saying, oh, look, or whatever it is, whatever is your dog's biggest distraction about the general public tend to do, 
turn that into a reinforcement that you can use mm -hmm. something besides, hey, let's go have a free for all with that person. Because uh -huh. if you can do yeah. that, you'll be gold and the general public will not bother you nearly as much yeah. as what they used to. You know, I don't have to worry about if somebody says, oh, puppy, look, isn't he gorgeous? I don't have to worry that my dog is going to maintain his mate because he knows he will get highly reinforced for having even stronger focus on me in that situation. So that's my big one. And I'm sure I'll have a few others throughout the night. I'm not seeing any specific. Um, I say a word that are in common on the chat. So we have a few there. Um, Can I say a little bit about the geekiness of this? Yeah, this just a minute, work? just a minute. Okay. <laughs> so there are a few other people that say praise and getting permission to go say hi that are using mm -hmm. that as reinforcement as well. So I'll let Cindy make her geekiness comment. Okay. Then we'll talk more so about permission this to will probably that. lead into a little bit of Nick's reinforcers so when you food is a primary reinforcer because they have to eat they have to drink they probably don't enjoy drinking quite on the same level as they do getting liver treats um because that's like getting chocolate you know chocolate candies for us um but they when you the other reinforcers like play or other things or like pennies. Um, hey, puppy, puppy, puppy. Those are secondary reinforcers. And what those are, are reinforcers that you have paired with a, um, with a, a primary reinforcer to build value in the secondary reinforcer. Now, Nick loves to run, and that's actually a primary reinforcer because he needs to get more, he's got to get his springs moving more. And so when he was doing agility before I got hurt, um, I actually got in trouble or kind of dressed down a little bit by the, the our positive agility instructor because I cued him through uh, uh, um like a little ox, Oxford, or I don't know what you call them, a little hoop thing that she had that he was supposed to go under. And I cued him through that and he kept going. So I cued him through the next one and he kept going. So I cued him through the next one and she was, mad, she was a little frustrated with me because I wasn't slowing him down and giving him a cookie each time. Well, he was so excited and having so much fun. He didn't want the cookies. The cookies were they were a sec they were not a primary reinforcement at that point and you would have spit them out and well, so if he's asked, doing it correctly what's wrong with that pardon me if he's doing it correctly what's wrong with the way you're doing it because she wanted me to feed him cookies because all dogs respond to cookies no they don't i know that you know that i know my dog she didn't know my dog oh. and she's used to working with a different kind of high drive dog than a standard poodle so, you know, it, it, it's about knowing what your dog will and will not do and what they do find value. I have conditioned good dog and a happy voice coming from me and some rubs to be a positive reinforcer for him, Nick. So that if we're out in public, I can kind of give him some ear scratches and some things he likes that calm him down to reinforce being calmer and more relaxed and to let him know that he's appreciated there's at least one agility instructor i know of in the united kingdom that has taught her dogs that means they've done a good job and so that's really good when you go and you do an agility run and you come off the course and you're playing tug with your dog and everybody's going like this for your dog run because they're getting they're automatically going to get a secondary reinforcer for what they're doing it's like penny's puppy 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 can i ask you a quick question uh -huh. i caught it while i was finishing up eating but i wasn't here yet to comment when some who asked about prairie dog allowing them to be chased 
so we're not quite there yet. So just hold oh, okay. On. So basically, with our new format, um, if you have a reinforcement that is really unusual that you want to be discussed, type it in the chat screen. So we're going to work our way through them. So right now, the one that we're focusing on is um, being able to socialize with public or strangers or yeah. you know, the go say hi okay. to you. And I know a few people had put that in there. Um, anybody have any good tips with how they trained that or why they trained that or allowed the, you know, being able to socialize as a reinforcer? Go ahead, John. I would encourage people to be, the, sorry, court, be the treater, now let them go say hi. And then when you call them back, thank them for returning to you. They, the, they got the reinforcer as being social and then a reward for uh, focusing. Yeah, that's very good too. I tend to always reward my dog for, you know, coming back to me, whatever they've been doing, whether it's been, they've been socializing or I've sent them out for a long distance task or whatever, rewarding them afterwards, you know, that secondary reinforcement. There's also delayed reinforcement, which is another on the nerdy side that Cindy was just kind of talking about different types of reinforcement. And so some of these that we're going to discuss tonight could really fall into any of those categories. Um, you know, your main reinforcer, your secondary, your delayed reinforcer, different things like that. But yeah, I think it's really important that if we are using socializing as a reinforcer, that when we walk away from that socialization moment, that we're reinforcing them to go back to work as well. Anybody else there with with something they want to add to, you know, the greeting or socializing? Yeah, sorry, I'm just I'm doing my secondary job. <laughs> um, Patty was just messaged. So um, anyways, other than my, with Poe, she's always been a very social dog because when she was a puppy, my living situation was such that um, I had a roommate that always had little kids, little kids to teenagers coming over like several times a week, if not daily to, for a bike team. And they were always around the house. And so she really got to like interacting with these kids. She thought that was the best thing. And so, and then the little girl next door absolutely loved her. So we set up as a very young puppy before she was big enough to bowl over a child. We set up practicing meet and greets and so that she wouldn't do it. But she made it clear that she wanted to continue to do this, but she would restrain herself. And, and she always has. But when she sees a kid, her face just lights up. So if, especially if we're having a particularly long or stressful day, like when I took her to the um, Portland Waterfront Blues Festival, which was a long day every time I've gone, if there was a little kid that was being polite and nice, and wanted to, and asked me politely to pat her, I would allow her to go, I would allow her interaction. And Poe would sit quiet patiently and have the interaction and then she'd come back to me. And I, I think if you have a dog that will do that, I think it's a really nice way to interact with the public when possible. Um, it's not always possible. Nick, I don't think is ever going to be that dog because he's just not social the way Poe is. Bentley feed and my last service dog was the same way. And I mean she did, she did people pet her, but she would duck out of the way if she thought she was supposed to be working just because she thought that was more right. And he to he do and I love the Zool is more social and enjoys it. So I've really worked to turn that into a reward. And he tends to default to working when he's got his gear, his work gear on. So I, 
you know, I know he knows when he's working and when he's not working. So I don't, you know, I don't push it with him. I want him to be social, but it's, you know, it's not my job to provide the petting zoo. Right. Um, but it's, I think it's really important to watch your dog and make sure it, it is rewarding because it, they, you know, if they're ducking or moving away, it's not rewarding. If they're sitting there and they're leaning into the person, that's another story. Yeah. I find Guinness does that. So the next topic. Into him. Go ahead, Rhea. Oh, I find that Guinness does that with people who are experiencing anxiety, he'll lean into them. Mm. It's, it's just as like that with certain people too. Uh, and it's, I, I guess people have told me it's unusual that they're willing to work for someone else, but they sense it. They really do sometimes. I think that's a whole nother nerdy conversation as well, but, and maybe yeah. another night, but yeah, I get, I understand that because I've found that a lot, especially with dogs that are trained to alert with anxiety, tend to do it for more than one person. So our next one up on the list that we had multiples, and I'm kind of going to group a few things together. Um, it's basically the idea of play, but, you know, that's chasing. Um, so permission to chase the squirrel or chasing the ball or running in some fashion. So if you use chasing, running, that kind of play as a primary motivator, it's your turn. Who wants to go first? I will. I do because I, I actually, I've had a lot of problem with Nick disengaging from things. And so we've actually used it as a game and um, we've done it in two different ways where I have, I'll throw a, I have a several toy squirrels. Um, Nick, get squirrel. You're done hunting. Um, uh, I have several toy squirrels and I will throw them and then he'll bring them back to me and I'll give him some cues. And sometimes I'll give him a whole string of cues that he has to do in a row before I throw it. And then I'll throw it again and he'll go get it. And sometimes he catches it. And so we do this until he's tired of it, which is almost never. Um, the, uh, and the other one we do for disengagement is I'll take two chasers and we'll play tug with one that one will die we'll switch over to the other one and i'll give him a cue and we go back and forth with the two chasers and so we're using that actually not just we're using that as a reward but we're also using it as a game and as a reinforcer i mean it's like a i don't know it's a multi-purpose thing so does anybody else, before John, I'm going to put you on the spot based on your last comment, but before I get to you, does anybody else have any other tips in ways that they like, that they've learned to use chase or running or, you know, that kind of, you don't care if they play as a reinforcement? I think Patty had a question. I'm on my phone. I'm just listening right now. Okay. I'm not sure who who brought up um, the prairie dog thing because I wasn't on at that time, but I do need to address it at least for John because he's new here, and I think it it would affect you too, Cindy, because of where we live. We don't have prairie dogs. Okay, we do, and John's fairly new here. It's really in Arizona. It's a really bad idea to let them get close to prairie dogs. Um, they carry plague and we do get the, their fleas carry so especially. Squirrels and rats. And um, we do get cases in Arizona three or four a year, especially up on the res, but yeah, they carry it here too. And so really you don't want them anywhere near the prairie dogs. It's a really bad idea to let them chase them just for that reason. Many of them want to end up with plague. <laughs> Any of the little rodents or um, things of that nature tend to have um, plague. Yeah. Um, loves to dig up moles. And or, those don't the, bother me so uh, much. But like if he happens to get a field mouse, I always worry that that mouse has poison. 
Yeah, no, I didn't do shit. Or the, the other one you want to watch salt. out for if you're using chase of actual live animals that they could potentially get is um, they do most small animals carry rabies and you don't know which one's rabbit. And that we should take a moment real quickly to remind people if you're not chatting on topic, mute yourself because we do pick up background noise. Yeah, it's just helpful. And then if you unmute yourself, we know that you have something to contribute and want to talk so that we can call on you in order if you're unmuted. So, um, so John, I really liked your topic as far or your comment there in the text, as far as that being a fine line between reward and distraction. Do you want to explain that comment a little bit and what that means to you as a handler, trainer, whatever? It, um, play, I think, is very strong reinforcer. But if you let it go too long or get too intense, you've lost the training session. You've turned it into a play session. So it's a really fine line and it's gonna change with different sessions on the same dog, but different sessions depending on what you're teaching. Uh, if you're teaching uh, retrieval, you don't wanna throw something out there and tell them to go fetch as a reward. Now let the retrieve, come back, click, treat. And then once you finish that, then you can do a short play session, which I mentioned I typically do about 15 seconds, just to keep it short and brief, a quick wrestle, something like that, and back to work. It's just a, sort of like getting a dog to shake off. No, that is it, it, the way I use it. And it just, it's an interrupter a little bit, but it also, oh, look, we're having fun uh, type of idea. I think that's a really important point too, because if we are just working on it, I don't want to say just, if we're working on a training session so that we have a target goal, if we incorporate too much play in the middle of the session, that can make it harder for the dog to make progress on what our target for that training session is. You know, they're not going to proceed as fast. Little short bits of games there help, you know, they become that reinforcement, but also help the dog to keep momentum on what you're trying to train for that session. I do like to always end a training session on a game. And usually mm -hmm. it's going to be the same game that I played off and on during that training session. So well, I'm gonna, I, a little bit with a tug toy in the middle of my training session, but then after I'm all done training, I switch to the flirt pole which is still similar tug, but you know, more high speed and more energy and last longer. I'm gonna slightly disagree with you, Penny, because I think if you're trying to teach, like Nick has a core, uh, has a core deficiency, he wants to focus because he's got a high prey drive and I need it, that focus shifted back to me. So in order to do that, I'm actually playing games with him and it's the, I don't want to, I don't necessarily, I don't want to play him to exhaustion, but like when I throw the squirrel, that's kind of, and he brings it back and then has to do his cues. That's his reward is when I throw the squirrel. And right. Bring, but that's a short reward. That's a very short the, reward. The task so, you had at hand, it might not be. Right, but training, I'll but. also do that with, I'll do that with the flirt pole. But I, I also do that with the, with the chasers. And those are actually things I'm training. So I'm actually using a specific game to train the behavior. And if like you're chasing, if you're teaching them a retrieve, you can, if they don't bring the, whatever their retreat, like if you throw a ball and they don't bring it back to you the way, the exact way you want, they bring it back perfectly, you play the game. If they don't, they have to do, you know, they have to retry, but they don't get the same level of game return. And I think it's about, about tweaking your skills and it's, and everybody's got to do it their way because it's not, you know, like John, you're going to train differently than I do. I'm going to train differently than Penny does, you know, and it's going to be slightly different based on our personalities, our skills, the classes we've had in the past. Um, 
but I also think it's really good to do things like Nick's learning leg weaves. So we work on that every day. I'm going to start sending him in for leg weaves as a reward because when he does leg at some point, because when he does leg weaves, he gets right now, he's getting lots of cookies for leg weaves. And so as he's learning to do that, it's like, Hey, this is a high reward activity. So it's like getting your phone. I get lots of treats. So, you know, it's, the more you can put value into things like that, the better, and you, the more you can make it enjoyable to the dog, the more play, the more it becomes play to them. I want to add though, what you're saying. that to not rely on the toys for the reward. Oh. Just make it be you like a little horse wrestle dog for a few seconds. Oh yeah, I know. Cause that, cause that keeps the dog's focus on you. Well, right, that's what the not a, doesn't become work. a district. But that's what the, I control the toys. I control the leg weaves. I control the other stuff that I have him do. I've got like, I don't know, 30, 40 games that I play with him at least. And he, they're not all food motivated. They're not, but it, it, he knows and it's, about with him at the playing the game playing i mean i think penny's got the mouth game um where you play like a sharky game or something with yeah yeah but it's just kind of finger play almost yeah there's all kinds of little becomes the tug because he has a soft play. mouth <laughs> mm -hmm. so there's all kinds um that you can play with them that don't necessarily have to do with, oh, let me grab the tug or the chaser or the flirt pole. There's, you know, you can have them chase you. They love that game. So, you know. And I think we're kind of talking about two different play or training scenarios is why you said you were going to disagree. Cause I don't disagree with you. I agree that I use a lot of games as my specific training session for whatever my target is. Like all the stuff I've been doing the past week with my parkour is all fun and games. It's one giant play session, but we're going through different skills that builds on our teamwork. So the general teamwork is the overall goal yeah. of that training session is to have fun as a team. So I use in the fun and games as reward and to actually do my training. It's different if you're doing something where you're training something specific, say um, opening doors, for example. So you're using a tug rope to open the door and then maybe right after they open the door, you might pull the tug rope off and play with them with that tug rope and then slide it back on the door. So when you're doing something specific like that, that's when you need to keep your play session short in between your work. So it's work, short play, work, short play because then you're not using games as an overall concept for what you're trying to teach. So I think it really depends on what your goal is for that session that you're having. If you're teaching a very, um, what's the right word? I'm having a word finding issue. If you're teaching a very specific behavior, you're teaching the dog to go to the refrigerator and get your beer, close the door or open the refrigerator get your beer, close the door and bring the, refer the um, beer back to you. You need to be a lot more specific with how you train that than if you're trying to train a concept. And if you're trying to train a, teach a concept, like teach the dog to think in arousal or to think um, with a dimmer switch, then games are really appropriate for the concepts. But when you get into actual service dog behaviors they're less helpful yeah totally agree with you. It depends on what you're training yeah but I, I want to point out that my point was using the play as a reward not as a method of training it's just the reward okay I, uh dog brings me the beer then i play for a few seconds oh yeah There's, of course you have no, to report it's them. just it's just a reward no, nothing more <laughs> Right. Yeah. And in that situation, you want to keep it short and sweet. Just a yeah. bit and go back to work. That's right. Yeah. It just depends on it depends on the situation that you're that you're in at the moment. And 
um, what you're training, you know, because it, and the dog, you know, Poe wouldn't, Poe's not a play dog. When you try and play Poe, po, tug with Poe, you end up pulling her around by the um, tug toy that you're using where, and she won't, she might growl a little bit, whereas po, Nick gets really, really into it. Poe won't play ball. Nick, Poe won't retreat. Po, well, Poe knows how to retrieve, but she has a limited number of retrieves. She won't retrieves. do it for a game. <laughs> she, no, she will, but she won't do it with the ball. She's not into chasing the ball. It's, she'll go get a dumbbell because I want her to get a dumbbell and I'm gonna give her a cookie. Mm -hmm. That's her motive. Mm -hmm. So you the, have to look- The retrieve at the isn't motivating, the treat is. Right. So you have to look at the dog and figure out, but on the other hand, if I'm teaching her to work on, uh, to work on sit pretty, she's like, oh yeah, I really like this behavior because it gets me up and I get to be close to mom and I, you know, I'm tall. So I, you know, I can knock things over and, um, so you have to look at the dog and what's going to motivate them and breed comes into that because you know, Great Pyrenees is probably not going to retrieve as much as a poodle. And a um, poodle is probably not going to hurt the way, a, you know, want to hurt everything the way a border collie does. Great reward for a border collie. If you have the option, let them go herd the geese for a minute. But so along that same lines, another one of our, you know, game based things that was in the suggestion was running. And so I have a husky. <laughs> Azul actually is not like he enjoys running, but it's not highly motivating to him. But one of my good friends, at, who is also a service dog handler, not here tonight, her dog Maverick loves to run. So trying to figure out ways to use running as a motivation has been challenging for us because, you know, if if you're at home working on a training session, it's a little bit easier. You can stop the run, but then once he's running, how do you stop the run to go train again? You know, that back and forth, the same kind of issue John was talking about. But if you're doing a training session, trying to generalize something out in public, it's a little bit harder to do that. So I kind of developed a game with Maverick in mind, but it also just kind of helped fine tune Azul's heel and focus work. And that was um, a quick, quick, slow kind of game. So a basic pace change game where we rapidly change pace and he's got to stay in a heel and he'll do it both on leash or off leash. So teaching Maverick how to play that game was a huge game changer because if all of a sudden he's distracted by something, being the teenager that he is and easily gets distracted, you can easily redirect him by picking up your pace because that's his top number one motivator. So I was just curious if anyone else used running per se as a reinforcement or motivator or reward and how they went about doing it. And I see that John had a comment on there. Oh, I see. His is wondering whether it's running, if the dog actually running or the dog being chased. So um, yeah, actually Maverick loves both of those. So like him and Azul will run and chase each other and have a blast. And that's a great way to end any kind of training session when we're all done because it's you know a delayed reinforcement that way. But just the act of being able to run, even if there isn't a toy to chase or another dog to chase, or he literally just likes to go fast. So he actually would go, oh, I think I may have froze. I'm gonna try to reconnect. He hadn't, my sister has always froze. <laughs> <laughs> my sister has always driven, I can't drive. So my sister has always driven me to agility and she has a very distinctive truck. She has a three quarter ton or one ton. I think it's a three quarter ton. Anyways, it's a Ford diesel 
it's a big truck. It's a loud truck because it's a full size truck used for hauling horses. So she, she comes over to pick me up and Nick sees her truck and hears her truck and we stick the crate where the crate goes in the truck. We load Nick and Nick, Nick is just aching to get in the crate. He, he's jumping in the truck, getting in the crate and going faster than we can manage him. He was going to the vet to get fixed. Um, he wasn't as happy to get back in the truck after that, but he's been conditioned so much to going to agility in that truck. And he likes going to agility that that truck means agility. So um, getting in the truck was a reward for him because he thought, oh, cool, I get to go run. <laughs> Right. And oh. that can actually be somewhat rewarding. It's like, but, pardon me. I didn't know my mic was on. It says it's off. Sorry. That's okay. That's so, okay. Back with the, is it being chased or rough or chasing something or just running? Um, for Azul, who loves to chase, the flirt pool is very reinforcing for him or, you know, an end of session kind of game or even a beforehand to get him warmed up kind of game because he enjoys the chase. Maverick, on the other hand, he'll kind of sort of chase the flirt pool, but it's just, it's not as fulfilling for him. But I can literally take the leash, a longer leash, and put it on his harness and run him circles around my body with nothing to chase, like you might do with a flirt pole with Azul, where Azul's chasing it, but Maverick will just literally sit there and run the circles, because the faster he can go, the more he runs, the more happy he is. You should put that on cue and teach him to lunge. Well, that's both basically it. It's like lunging a horse. That's yeah, and then you teach him to go you know, off flip to the back flip so that it's not getting tangled. The leash is, you know, it might be a little taunt, but not tight. And he knows he can only do it when he's been given permission to do it. And we'll go both directions so that he's not stressing legs or, you know, from constantly the muscles in direction. But that's been an unusual way that we have found to reinforce him. So there's all kinds of different things out there. Um, anybody else have an absolute favorite like reinforcement toy based or game based reinforcement that they love? Well, Nick likes loves the flirt pole. But a lot of most of the time we use the indoor cat one and it's got like one of those really long unstuffed toys on the end of it so it moves pretty wild and he just thinks that's the cat's meow and Azul loves his flirt pool too more so when he was a little bit younger and had more energy I mean he's still only two so he has tons of energy but <laughs> He doesn't have that need to do it. And it would help us get closer to objects that might be more distracting for him because the flirt pool is more fun than whatever that distraction might be, like the squirrel or whatever. But I don't remember what else I was gonna say, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, the flirt pool is a fun one. Um, our next kind of topic that was put on by multiple people in a few different ways was the act of sniffing. Is there anybody who wants to talk about how they've turned sniffing itself into a reinforcement or motivator? I will sometimes. I can... oh, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm trying to switch to my computer and then I'll comment on that, but go ahead. Okay. While so Nick, likes he does more air scenting than he does nose on the ground and he likes to stare and sniff at cats and so what i have started doing is when he's really good and we go someplace like pet smart um where there's cats under glass or we go to someplace or guinea pigs under glass um we will go and um, if he's being good, we'll play a little bit of look at that, but then I'll let him sniff it a little bit. And as long as he's not amping up, if he's amping up, then we move away. 
but um, I also let him look at the cats on some of the walks and it's made a huge difference because he's not, oh, there's a cat, I must, you know, I'm so excited, I can't help it. Now he's like, okay, I am allowed to look at it. I just, it, it's a little less exciting. I still wanna chase it, but okay. But it's mostly air scenting. Um, so I let him, uh, you know, it's not something I'm gonna get after him about because if he air scents something, I don't think it's a big deal in the store. No, I'm totally cool with air scenting. I know a really popular way to use um, sniffing as a reinforcement is like with loose leash walking, the dog pulls tight on the leash, you stop moving so then they're not getting to that tree or whatever it is they want to smell. And when they release the tension on the leash, you move up so that they can sniff. So you're using the sniff as the thank you for releasing leash tension. And that's a really, really common one. I've kind of bumped it up with Azul too, because he has, from a very, very young age, had a really good potty on cue. And when he was younger, we would, you know, maybe spend more time sniffing outside to get used to an environment before going in. But now that he is older and we're pretty much in the same environments all the time. He doesn't need that, you know, long sniff about before we go inside somewhere that we tend to do it more now when we come out as a reward for the focus, mm -hmm. for, you know, the work he did while we were in, kind of like saying hi to somebody when we leave the store, you know, between going out the door and hitting the car somewhere in between there, we'll either stop to greet somebody or maybe we'll put our stuff in the car and then go sniff. And I find that we're both just more content and it's more of a distressor and happy, you know, just to be, whereas you're not trying to hurry your dog along because you got someplace you need to be. So I've used that with sniffing. Sniffing is really one of Azul's biggest motivators the or you know self reinforcers so whenever we've had a really long day out and about the first thing we do when we get home is usually a sniff about of some sort and depending on how stressful our outing was can depend on you know how long we make that sniff about if it was really stressful we might be out there sniffing for an hour or so but it's very rare for anything to be that stressful for Azul. So, you know, then typically we just, um, you know, five, 10 minutes, it's his time to just be him. Sometimes he even gets put you know, on his long line tie out and I can go in the house and put groceries away or whatever. And he's content with that. It's his dog time, basically. So there it's not so much of a reinforcement as maybe a de-stress like the shake off, but, we've conditioned that like my last service dog, we had to come home and play a game after every outing because that's what she needed in order to de-stress. So for Zool, it's the general sniffing is his form of enjoyment. It's what he enjoys the most. So that's what we do. Okay, I have just, a question. Go ahead, John. Um, would it be appropriate to preset a scatter trail, a kibble trail? and just let the dog, for a reward, let the dog go sniff for a moment and find something and go back to another area and continue the training session and just keep going back and forth. Yeah, you scatter feed for reward. I did yeah. that a lot with Azul when he was younger. He has food issues now, so he doesn't enjoy it as much. But yeah, when he was younger, I would scatter feed a bunch in one, yard, in one spot of the yard and it might only be 10 feet away from where we were training, but yes. So we would go back and forth, work on focus, you know, whatever we were working on training in that session outside in the yard as we were trying to generalize stuff and then move back over into the scatter feed area and then move back and, you know, train some more and, you know, kind of bounce back and forth like that as well. Okay, yeah, thank you. I have a feeling that's probably why sniffing is so valuable to him because it was so highly reinforced when he was younger. With Azul being a scent alert dog, and he does his migraine alerts based on scent, 
probably since the time he was eight weeks old, I've developed his nose and being able to distinguish scents. So I then, you know, have to let him use it. I've trained him to use his nose. I have to let him use it in the dog way to use it. So the other thing I would caution people about, depending on your dog, and this is probably more geared towards dogs like Nick, who's really, he's not your typical dog and he would have failed any program. Um, I'll just put that out there. He's not, he's going to be a high maintenance dog for the rest of his life. Um, but that's okay. He's exactly what I asked for from the breeder. That said, you need to watch this when you say, let, allow, use scent as, a, when you use scent, because Nick can easily become overstimulated by the scent, especially if he's in a new area. And so when they start becoming overstimulated and over aroused, that's not a reward because nobody wants a behavior associated with an over aroused dog because it goes very quickly to barking, lunging through a whole list of stuff of inappropriate behaviors because they're overstimulated. And it doesn't mean that it's not rewarding. It just means they're overstimulated. I have to do that with Azul too. Um. So, so you much can more use, calm and laid back than Nick, almost polar opposites there. Yeah. Sniffing, especially, so we have a trail that we like to walk that's a mile. And there was a time, especially like towards the end of winter at when things were thawing and scents were stronger, that Azul just couldn't handle a mile walk. By the time he got halfway around the lake, he was overexcited just from overload of smells and we would have to stop so that he could you know regain his brain and we still had snow on the ground at that time so it's not like there was a convenient place to stop and hang out for 20 minutes but it was the only way we could make it on that mile so we had to then look at you know shorter distances areas that I could watch him closely and if I saw the sniffing getting him too overexcited we could turn around and head back to the car. So instead of loops kind of trails, we would do an out and back kind of trail because that would help him kind of control it. Heading back would be easier than um, going out because he had already smelled most of the smells there. But yeah, so it's that fine line between it being de-stressing or being over arousing, being a reinforcement versus being a distraction you know, sniffing is one of those that really, it can vary with your dog, you know, different dogs, different things, or it can vary from your dog day to day based on whatever else has been involved in your day or the other triggers they've had or the other excitement they've had kind of thing. So it's definitely been a really challenging one for me to utilize and learn to utilize, but I've tried really hard. <laughs> um, I use sniffing with Rainy, when she was younger, my dogs are so food motivated. They don't care about toys. They, food is easy. But when we go out on walks, she would get over aroused with all the smells. And the only thing that she wouldn't take treats, but if, if I would stop when she started pulling and then she would lose the leash, then she could go sniff something. And she's also learned from that if she stops and stops walking and looks at where she wants to sniff for permission then she gets then I'll get let her go over there and sniff that so sniffing is about the only other thing that I've got to reinforce my goldens with but I don't really need it unless they won't take food the only time I've ever seen her not take food when she wasn't stressed was on a walk because everything's going on the, the nice thing about having a foodie dog is when you go into stores, when you're teaching the, you know, the young behaviors and you're working on generalizing sits and downs and stays and things, you have something that's easily used for rewards. Um, secondary rewards tend to be a little bit harder to reward mm -hmm. unless you happen like, oh, I'm at PetSmart. There's all kinds of things to smell or um, I'm at the zoo, there's all kinds of things to smell. Or I'm at, you know, 
blues festival. Um, let me find a good kid, you know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> go ahead. One thing I wanted to say when you were talking about overwhelming smells, mm -hmm. especially in like um, our train service dogs and some of the other groups, people ask about church and whether they can take their dogs or sometimes whether they should. And this came up a few, a couple of months ago. I don't know how many churches still use it, but I know the Catholic church sometimes does and High Mass and the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church do as well. I would never take a service dog into a church that is using incense. I think that could do a lot of, um, and it's something to think about when someone asks about that. Um, that incense can be pretty destructive to human noses, let alone dogs. I can't imagine what it would do to their so they would handle that for like um stores like bath and body that have all the lotion and yeah, that's really stuff what about um, with my set trained there. dogs i'm very careful there to avoid any of those you know super super strong scented objects whatever they be or you know a room where there's multiple so a specific room where incense is burning Jeez. or a candle shop or something to that i don't go into in the church they walk they walk down the aisle and they swing this massive incense burner back and forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't escape it. It's horrible. <laughs> I go to the Catholic church sometimes, but I've never noticed it, even being able to smell it. I guess that is different in different churches. The but Orthodox I know how they clean the incense, and we've even, you know, um, funerals, they do it too. But I've never, from my seat, smelled it. I'm but surprised. Also it also depends on what it, are you there on a regular Sunday or are you there on a Usually for high mass, high mass, like a, a very, um, like if you go on Easter Sunday, it's going to be overpowering. I went to, ma to mass at, um, the mission in San Luis Obispo when I was in college for Easter Sunday with a friend of mine, and I could not believe how overpowering it was. Yeah. I wouldn't subject my dog to that at all. No, no, no. And I wouldn't subject my dog to Macy's on perfume day or for that matter, any department store that has a perfume department, beauty department like that. I mean, yeah, just I going, even. even on the floor beneath it, it's still going to reek and going by the door is going to reek. Yeah. Good thing we're past 10 o'clock or just hitting 10 o'clock because that's like good points, generally good points, but way off topic because it's Sorry. reinforcement. <laughs> so, but I, I mean, I totally agree with you. I'm very, very careful to protect my dog's nose because that's his number one most important task, uses his nose and his scent and dog's noses can get burned out or, you know not be as efficient if they get overwhelmed with smells, just like their ears can have issues if you take them into a place that has extra loud sounds or you know, you're know you shooting guns around them all the time and they're not wearing ear protection or whatever it is, any kind of, anytime you're hitting a sense too strongly, too frequently, that sense is gonna be dull. I do, I do use sniffing as reinforcement for like um, you said about the pulling, when when he stops pulling, I do allow him the freedom to sniff. So a few things to get him to stop pulling. Mm -hmm. As far as Guinness goes, it doesn't always work, but when it does, he gets to sniff. <laughs> does anybody have any scent-based or sniff-based games that they love for like? So not necessarily reducing a behavior you don't want by allowing the sniff when they do what you want, like in the leash thing that Ray was just talking about. But so like my go-to scent-based game is a basic find it game where I start out with heats treated or heats treated, treats hidden. And then I merge on to being able to hide toys or other household objects or things that my dog commonly retrieves and constantly get it. So Nick loves my phone. Nick loves my phone. And so we've turned that, it, that game into a task. So he is into find a phone and he will search for it. 
and um, which is really nice. It got stuck between the cushions and down in, you know, that little wedge between yeah. the back and the seat. It got stuck down in, <laughs> in there. And he did a very persistent alert that he was digging for it. That's so, good. yeah. Does anybody so, play any other games besides like find it or hunt for a specific object? Um, muffin tin was set in half. Tennis balls. You can hide treats and uh, not all of them. You want to just randomly put them in the muffin tin things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then you cover cover all of the things with the cut in half tennis balls. It's a cheap food toy, but it teaches them to use their nose to figure out which is which. And right. the dogs love it. As far as I know, I haven't seen one yet that didn't like it. <laughs> There's a lot of good, um, you know, Patty, scent based challenges that are good for dogs. <laughs> so the tennis balls and the muffin tin, you know, there's all kinds of things you can buy like that. They're all great different puzzle toys. Um, another thing that we like to do is we'll take a treat or a couple of treats and put it like inside a box. And then maybe that box is buried or wrapped in bubble wrap. And then maybe it's put inside another box. And then maybe it's, you know, so it's the same kind of puzzle game kind of experiment. But starting out small with just a treat hidden yeah, to get at, and then slowly making it more and more challenging. I mean, <laughs> one time we had a treat inside a box, wrapped in bubble wrap, inside another box, wrapped in a blanket, inside another box with a exercise ball, one of the giant balls that you can sit on, exercise ball on top of it, and a blanket thrown over that. My husband is like, oh man, this is going to take the dog minutes to figure out. No, it was less than a minute and they had that treat out because they they just water, you know, they knew there was going to be a treat somewhere in there and they just kept digging until they found it later upon later. I, I very carefully saved the tubes for the toilet paper rolls and I saved a shoe box and I filled each um, I put Poe's dinner in this shoebox in the, I put it, I filled the toilet paper rolls and folded over the ends and put the toilet paper rolls in the shoebox. It was gone in like five seconds. <laughs> and yep. she was, oh, she's been over at Ken's house. She came back this weekend because it's, we're going to have hundred degree weather and I don't want her out in the hundred degree weather. So there's she's also getting clipped and so anyway so she comes over and the first thing that happens is her nose goes down on the ground and she starts sniffing out all the all the um kibble and cookies that nick has left laying around the house so i now have cookie free carpet but i have polar, but i have pyrenees hair everywhere of right. course <laughs> Yep. I think Patty's busy feeding puppies that are awake. Okay. I've got two adolescents here and they let me have a nap for two and a half hours, but they're not happy that I'm on here talking. Nice. About <laughs> I need to feed a dog. You need two flirt poles, Patty. <laughs> My dog don't care anything about flirt poles. <laughs> Poe talk oh, somehow oh. talked me out, out um, talked me into scatter feeding her. Oh, I don't want to kick anybody out. I just want to make sure, is there anything else um, reinforcement based, unusual reinforcement that we haven't touched on yet tonight that we want to throw in there before I stop recording? Did, oh. we, did we talk about even going out the gates? Um, we've oh, got we lots of that. that one. We did, you did? We did talk? not. Okay, we have oh, lots God. of gates. I have in my house like four gates and then I've got a fence inside of fence. So I've probably got five or six gates on fences and my dogs love gates and they love this gate in the kitchen gives you access to the doggy door that goes outside. So gates are pretty important to, our, to all our dogs. It, it's, they know when they go out a gate, we're going somewhere. And it's gate zen has been real easy with them because they've learned the reinforcement for 
waiting or sitting or whatever and not mugging the gate is you get to go out the gate. So we do use the gate itself opening up as a reinforcement for, for waiting. That's a really, really good point too. I did that with, a, he was a Malam, I think he was a Malamu Husky cross we never had his DNA check because it was before they did that, but he was too big for a Husky and too small for a Malamu. And he was the most hyperactive dog when we first got him, but bit the fence, did all this stuff within probably 24 hours of doing gate vent zen. I had him on the other side of the fence, so I couldn't, uh, and he would sit and wait for me to open the gate for his kennel to come through to get, or he'd sit on the other side of the gate and wait for me to bring his food into his kennel and for me to go in and then wait when I came and picked up their bowls and brought them back in the house to wash. And he was just, he just got it real quick. It's like, oh, good things happen when the gate opens. You come in and fun things happen because we always played and, you know, I was never in there for like two seconds. It was always, you know, half hour, 45 minutes to play with the dogs. That was when I was married to somebody who wouldn't let my dogs in the house. He's I love the idea of like using food in training sessions, but I think for me, it's important that I don't want food to be the end all be all motivator for that job. So, I mean, I want job. dogs, any job. Well, <laughs> so it is at my dogs house. Dogs are more food motivated, like Patty's goal. It's the end all, it's everything right. center of right. life in our house. But for me, and you know, I mean, my dogs are like, they'll work for food, but I don't want to have to like nonstop have a bowl full of food on me all the time. Granted, I have food on me at all times, typically, but you know, nowadays it's less, you know, I might have a small handful instead of a giant bag full on me <laughs> kind of thing. But so yeah. I like to look at whatever would come naturally like you had mentioned the gates, Patty, the gates become the motivation for weight. And being able to run out the gate becomes the self reward. So you're not having to give them food after they run out of the gate. Well, no, you don't. And the other thing about the gates are even with my foodies, when you, when they get excited about, I get to go fishing, you know, we're going to do this. They don't really want a cookie anyway at that right. time, even though their food right. is, they what they pay. want is that gate to open. And that's a wonderful reinforcer for calm behavior and just sitting quietly with the gate open. And even when it opens, you wait for the okay. Right. Well, and that's Nick, my point is that yeah. look for those things that are in your day-to-day -day life that you can turn into self-reinforcing behaviors, whether it be being able to go out the door or the gate or whether it's being able to just go out and sniff on your own, like a Zolex or whatever it is, look for things that are in your day-to-day -day life that are already reinforcing for your dog and then figure out ways that you can use that to your advantage. So like being right. able to rush through the gate is self-rewarding. And our dogs are gonna self-reward whether we want them to or not, you know, whether that's pulling us around on the leash because we haven't stopped it, they're going to find some way of rewarding themselves in their day-to-day -day life. So yeah. we can look at what is important to us and teach them how to self-reward in ways that meet our needs as well. You know, that in itself is very, very helpful in training when we can figure that out, when we can figure out the proper ways to allow our dog to do the self rewarding that isn't going to drive us nuts. Like Azul's digging. Azul absolutely loves to dig. Um, I've got him down to like, very rarely will he start to dig in a normal grass area. But if he does, I can just simply remind him not there. And he knows that on our next opportunity, I'm going to take him out into the field or let him go in our dog run area where he knows it's a free for all and he can dig to his heart's content and he's gonna find something good even if it's just smells. But you know, so looking at those things that your dog naturally loves and figuring out how to incorporate that 
so that they can do their self-reinforcing in approved ways instead of against what we want them to trip to learn. <laughs> Anything else there as far as reinforcement goes? We could, well, when, when we talk nice. about using things that to reinforce them for what, what we want them to do, we also have to remember, even with the gates, that those things are self-reinforcing. And if we don't use them to reinforce the behavior we want, we're going to reinforce the behavior we don't want. The, right. If I didn't use the gates that way, what I'm reinforcing is you open a gate and you zip out and you got reinforced. So that it goes both ways. Right, or look, my parents' dog, my, it, it hangs over the gate and I find it totally obnoxious and I, it doesn't do it for me, but it still does it for them. She hangs over the gate because my mom will start, the, she can't open the gate because the dog's hanging over it, but then she's sitting there cooing and baby talking the, the dog. And then they wonder why the dog hangs on the gate. And they have to redo the gate every so often. And we're always going to have those things where we, you know, we're one thing that is our pet peeve that we can't stand, but somebody else doesn't mind and we'll reinforce. I mean, well, I know that I reinforce some things with Azul that most people would go, oh, I can't believe you'll do that. Especially in the service dog community. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'll tell on myself for one of them because it, it works for us. And I've done it since he was teeny tiny. But so Azul is probably one of the calmest dogs I know around mealtime and he does not beg. But when we are home and I started when he was younger with kibble and when I would take a couple of bites of my food and I'd give him a couple of pieces of kibble and that would be how he would get one of his meals a day as a young puppy. And then it slowly became, you know, food off of my plate instead of kibble. And to this day, he knows that if he wants reinforcement and I'm eating dinner, the best way to do it is to calmly lay at my feet and I will drop stuff for him or hand feed him or it works here too. And to my husband's dismay, here. let him eat something off of my fork because he can do that without touching the fork. <laughs> so can mine. I've got two dogs that can do that without touching the fork. But you know, that's there's so many people that don't think service dogs or dogs in general even should eat table scraps and it's just something that I've always done granted I'm picking out the healthiest of table scraps right. to know what's good for them and not but right. I've had sausage fall off of my pizza in a pizza place and land on Azul and him totally ignore it and leave it there and yeah. later three minutes with that sausage on him until it accidentally rolled off and laid on the floor and still I totally ignored it because he knows if I'm not giving it to you, then you don't eat it. Whether it's people food, whether it's, you know, anything. His one exception to that is probably gonna be the moles he finds in the ground because I don't give them to him, but he's got them before. <laughs> I know he's got them, but- Eat them or bring them home. Our way of doing it. And I'm sure there's, all kinds of other things out there that people, you know, habits that people don't mind that other people dislike. That's just kind of the nature of owning a dog. So if I give them something that works for us, you know, while I'm cooking or something, the only difference is I go over to, because he is a, pardon the expression, food whore, and will counter surf if, if he gets the chance. If I'm going to give him something while I'm cooking, I go over to his dish and put it in his dish just because I don't want to reinforce. Well, I stopped the, the counter kitchen. surfing with Nick by um, when I was cooking, I would throw him kibble periodically. And then he learned to park in the kitchen. Now he parks outside the kitchen because he gets more kibble that way, or he got more <laughs> kibble. We pretty much stopped it. Um, but at the by the same token, if I'm cooking and I drop something and I don't, you know, I'll eat, if it's like a utensil, I'll have him pick it up. If it's food that he can eat, I'll have him clean it up. So right. I've turned those into things that are to my benefit, but Nick benefits from them as well. I don't typically feed in the kitchen either. And Azul has never counter surfed. Like one time as a puppy, he kind of ran his nose along the counter and I reminded him of the leave it, which he knew at the time. But 
he's never tried. And I think that's because he knows the food comes when he lays calmly at my feet. And he gets yeah. plenty of it, you know, knowing that he knows the behavior it takes to earn it. And he gladly does it. He doesn't try to do other behaviors. He's never raided the trash. He's never... And I have taught him, he'll get up on the counter to get my glasses or get my phone or whatever. So he can get on the counter, but he's never once taken food off the counter. Well, he, so, he said yeah. this steak a couple of months ago. Luckily I got it with <laughs> only one tooth mark in it. <laughs> That's a miracle. Go go. So I will talk to you all later. All okay. right, have a good night. Good night, you right. You know, so, and I, we are past yeah. done. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. If somebody wants to keep talking, you know, we're welcome to hang out. But it's also, I think we covered a lot of ground. So mm -hmm. I think we have some tips to help people with reinforcement.